Hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here, and thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Anel Kardanov, and today I'm going to talk about uh, why DSL is better than two incomplete languages for DeFi. But before we start, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit more about DeFi itself. Uh, I think uh, all of you know about DeFi Pulse website. Uh, right now, DeFi is the uh, most prolific growing space in the blockchain, uh, with more than $600 million circulating on chain. So, and it is increasing, still increasing. For example, in the last year, it increased almost three times. So uh, we talk a lot about DeFi, we talk a lot about uh, the most used uh, blockchain applications. Uh, so today I'm going to cover some technical aspects about smart contracts and languages about DeFi. Uh, but before we start, I'd like to ask you, what is a DeFi? What's the definition of DeFi? So I'd like some, to interact with you somehow. So what do you think? What is a DeFi? Is there a definition of DeFi? Or some intuition, maybe, what is a DeFi? Come on, guys, just, I don't know, what is it? Maybe it's just like digital assets. DeFi is digital assets. No, no, yeah. If you interact directly with your uh, um, counterparties without going through an intermediary, and just using, using the blockchain and smart contracts on the blockchain as the interaction point. So to interact without intermediaries. When you're sending, yeah, for, for financial. For financial, OK. Um, are there any other options and opinions about what is a DeFi? No? Okay. Um, what, is, what is a DeFi? We can say that the simplest, thing, the simplest uh, definition for DeFi is digital assets. But it is not correct because banks also work with uh, digital assets, right? Or digitalized analog assets. Uh, maybe DeFi is a transparent digital assets. How do you think? Is it a correct definition for DeFi? Why? Why it is not? A... Sorry? Uh, why they should be transparent? Because it's on a blockchain. That's it's, and it is decentralized. So if we want to keep it decentralized, we have to make it transparent, right? Okay. Uh, maybe it works, but centralized exchanges are transparent digital assets as well. So it is not a correct definition for DeFi. My own definition is transparent programmable digital assets. That's the definition for DeFi in my opinion. Maybe you are not agree with it, maybe you are, but this is the simplest, shortest intuition about what is a DeFi. Transparent programmable digital assets. What is digital assets? The simplest definition is tokens, okay? Or some kind of assets, but usually we, we talk about tokens. Why it is transparent? Because it's uh, on a public blockchain, so everybody can see, everybody can understand what's going on and what's happening with it. Another question, what is a programmable? What does it mean? This is the hardest question uh, in this definition. What is a programmable in this transparent programmable digital assets? To understand what is programmable, I'd like to talk a little bit more about current centralized financial systems and compare it with DeFi. Uh, right now, in banks, what do we have? Usually, we have indirect ownership of some assets, right? It means that we cannot, we do not have the full control over our assets. We just can do something with it, but not everything. Uh, and at any time, bank can, for example, request some documents to do some operations, or at any moment they can say, okay, we do not want to work with you anymore, please take your money and get out from here, or some kind of that. It is possible, so that's why we call it indirect ownership. In DeFi, we have direct ownership over our assets. Okay, another important uh, thing is that with usual banking system, we can add only basic constraints on top of our assets. What does it mean? It means that, for example, we can say that there is a limit, I cannot spend more than $10,000 $10, from this card, for example. Or we can say that um, nobody can transfer, or, no, me and only one other person can transfer money from this card. We can do that kind of constraints, but only basic constraints. With DeFi, we can have rules, constraints, some requirements. We can add almost any kind of logic on top of our assets and on top of our money. And to, 
the simplest intuition again is that in, with banks, with digital banks, usually as a person, you do not have an API to work with your bank. You do not have an API to work with your money and to do everything that you want. And there are intermediaries everywhere. So there was a definition that we want to work with money without intermediaries, but with banks, we have a lot of intermediaries. For example, if we want to uh, uh, accept, some, I don't know, if you want to do, sell something, accept dollars on our e-commerce website, we have to work with intermediaries because it is not even possible to just directly get payments from your users. And with DeFi, there are no intermediaries. And there is another very cool feature for DeFi. It is composability. It means that one DeFi product can rely on another DeFi product or can use another DeFi product. So uh, I just want to show you that programmable means that we do have direct ownership over our assets. We can add any rules and constraints or requirements, maybe not any, but almost any, to our assets. There are no intermediaries, and it should be composable. I mean that a couple of products, they have to be able to work with each other without intermediaries. Does it make sense? OK, how usually we use smart contracts to, to make our finance, our assets programmable? How do we usually write smart contracts? Here is, for example, a smart contracts from 0x. You, it's uh, for EVM, for, for, for Ethereum, with uh, one, two, three, four, five lines of code, and with, uh, as far as I remember, 14 lines of comments. This code is written using assembly. It is very low level. And this is how we usually do our DeFi products. Not only in 0x, in almost every DeFi product on Ethereum, you can see the code like this. How do you think? Is it a bad, bad or good idea to write this kind of code for finance? Is it a good idea? Uh, maybe, maybe. But I want to ask you a couple of questions. Um, as far as I understand, you want to take a picture, so feel free to take a picture of this crappy code. Um, so I want to ask you a couple of questions. So why banks don't use PHP, JavaScript, C, or Python for their business logic? I have some experience in uh, banking, and uh, usually they write their business logic using some uh, DSLs or at least Java. Here's, for example, the list of most popular languages, most used languages in the world, and Java is in the first place. Why, do, why? What's the reason why Java is so popular? Not only it's because, I don't know, old enough, or there are a lot of tools, and not only because of it, but because Java is uh, very good in terms of performance, but at the same time, it is, we can say that it's high-level language. Not a DSL, but very high-level language. So, uh, Sometimes, yeah, we can see products using C, for example, the performance is very important, or uh, maybe PHP even. To be honest, uh, I've never seen any financial products uh, using PHP. Only e-commerce websites, maybe, but I've never seen backends for banks or some kind of that. I don't want to say anything bad about PHP. Uh, I, I have some experience with PHP. I coded in PHP three years. I was happy at that time. But there, is, there are no types. Uh, it is very badly designed. So uh, yeah, at least there were no types since until uh, seventh version of, PH, version of PHP. But anyway, Java is like a good trade-off. I mean that um, it is readable, it is not DSL, but simple enough, and it has very good performance as well. So they do not use C. That's the main point. The banks do not use C or assembly code for uh, their financial services. And the next question is, what are the, sec the security requirements for DeFi products? Usually, security requirements for DeFi products is much higher than for banks. Why? Because if something is going wrong with the usual banking system, we can just say, oh, we'd like to revert this transaction. We can't do it with centralized system. We cannot do the same with decentralized finance systems. So uh, security requirements for DeFi products is even higher for, than for banks. OK, I think that after this arguments, I can say that a good smart contracts language is a one billion problem. Because at least there were three 
issues with the smart contracts, which led to more than $300 million, million dollars of um, damages. At least, it's just like I just found it in a couple of minutes and just Googling, so maybe there are even more. Uh, and this is a really huge problem. What can we do with it? Does this code fit our requirements for DeFi, this kind of code? This is, for example, a Bancor. The previous slide with creepy code, it was about 0x. This is a Bancor. So again, there is assembly code. There are like comments, again, just to describe what's going on here. So this is a very, very badly designed system. What are the best practices? What the industry says about the DeFi finance, about products when we want to be perfectly sure that it is secure? The software development industry says that demand-specific languages are solution for this kind of products and for this kind of requirements. Why? Because they're usually simple and specific. They're not designed for everything, so you pick a problem and you solve it. Uh, it introduces some limitations, yes, but that's the point. That's the main point of DSL. If developer, any, any developer, I'm a developer, my, 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 I'm a developer, I have six years experience of development, and I want to say that if I have a way to do something in a low level way, I usually will go that way. Not always, but at some point, eventually, I will write, write that low level code. Because I love to optimize, I love to fight for every byte, I love to do that bad things. So it is a good idea to have a DSL and to say, hey, dude, you're a developer. You, your main goal is to solve a business problem, not to write the absolutely perfect code or to fight for every byte. Your main goal is to solve a business problem. So it is a good idea to say, here are your limits. And they're usually security oriented, as I already said. Historical DSA, DSLs were used to implement super critical components, for example, to write a code for anti-braking system in your car. Or for supply chain, there are DSLs. Uh, there are also DSLs for some banks, for financial operations as well, uh, because they're security oriented. Before we go further, I just want to give you one intuition about DSL. Just imagine that we, you want to build a website and you do not have HTML and CSS. You have only control over every pixel on user screen. And you can set only the color of this pixel. Is it a good way to write, to make a website? I don't think so. That's what we are doing right now with smart contracts and DeFi. We're trying to set the color for every pixel on user's screen. That's the idea of assembly code using EVM. So, you're using HTML, CSS, I just can, in 10 minutes, I can make a layout, I can set colors, fonts, everything that I want, instead of writing, a, I don't know, millions of lines of code and setting the color of each pixel. So, there are some solutions, uh, there are some uh, products uh, right now, some DSLs which you can use for your smart contracts. So I'll just briefly overview some of them just to show you what kind of uh, problems you can solve using the DSLs for your DeFi products and how do they look like, the DSLs. For example, there is a Lira uh, from eTora. It's a domain-specific uh, language, declarative, uh, defining simple financial contracts for EVMs or for Ethereum. Uh, you can use for futures, loans, options, insurance, almost any kind of DeFi products. And it looks very simple. Here is, for example, a code of just like six lines of meaningful code. And it describes the scenario that A owns one Ethereum and A would like insurance uh, of a drop in the Ethereum price below $100 three months from now. So A would like a contract whose value plus the value of Ether is at least $100. So these six lines describes this scenario. Using Solidity or assembly code in Solidity, you'll have at least 50 lines. And this, read is much, this code is much more readable. And I'll talk about another very important feature of DSLs a little bit later. There's another language called Pact. It's a human-readable smart contracts language. 
the main idea behind PACT is to take a DSL for a database management system. PACT is originally from database management system as far as I know. Uh, and to make it uh, good for smart contracts, let's call it so. Uh, and it is an imprinted language with upgradable contracts. Uh, all contracts are natively multi-signatures, uh, capabilities-based permissions. It's a very interesting idea. I will not cover it now, but it's a very interesting idea. I recommend you to go to the PACT website by Cadena and just to understand the uh, capabilities-based permissions. Uh, to be honest here, I will not describe the code because it's like, uh, yeah, pre, 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 oh, sorry, yeah. It's about loans, so how you can make loan engine on uh, Ethereum as far as I remember. Here you can just uh, describe some uh, structures, describe functions, and it is all non-tune complete DSL. So domain-specific language for, not for only for DeFi, but mostly for DeFi. There's another language, uh, right? It's a functional expression-based strong type language uh, well, with, um, without virtual machine at all. It's interpreted as well with some built-in primitives without gas and with the for formal verification, built-in formal verification, you can call it so. Uh, it looks simple as well. Here's, for example, a uh, wallet, as far as I remember. Yeah, here's a wallet. So, for example, it's just like a function where you can deposit some uh, tokens. It just gets that amount of token and stores in the storage the value, the new amount of tokens you want to store, uh, with key of current key is your address. So you can call this function. The DSL will write in the contract storage, like, Key, in the key storage value, key, store, key value storage, it will store the key, your address, and the value is your, the value is uh, amount of tokens you deposited to this contract. Looks very, very simple. And you can withdraw it, it just checks that you, you, you do not, you are not able to withdraw negative amount, uh, you will not be able to withdraw more than you deposited to it, and it just updates the state of the contract and the storage of the contract, and it just transfers tokens. That's it. It is also upgradable, but it checks that to upgrade this smart contract, this D app, you have to, uh, it's a multi signature. Uh, you have to get two signatures from this public key and this public key. That's it. Again, it is very simple, not that assembly code. And we get more very, very good features. For example, with write, there are no loops, there are no recursions, there is no virtual machine. But we get, there is no guess. Code is much more readable. And the, uh, the costs are predefined, always. So you, can, you, up, you know upfront the complexity of the code. And you know that you have to pay this amount of uh, fees. That's it. So we get a lot of uh, advantages from this non-tuning complete approach. And it looks like block blockchain native because blockchains are very bad in terms of computations. And the code usually looks clear and safe. Um, it is declarative code. It is much, much easier to read. Uh, and it is formal verification friendly. So to formally verify non-tuning complete code is much easier than to verify tuning complete code. You can say that, but there are so many limitations. What we can do with, for example, with tuning completeness? There may be some cases when we need tuning complete systems. What are we going to do with it? Uh, to be honest, I can say that almost all blockchains are tuning complete systems. Maybe languages are non tuning complete, but the blockchain itself is a tuning complete system. There was a paper about it that every blockchain you can uh, imagine like a tuning machine because you have many transactions and you can just split your operations into multiple transactions and get the same result. Uh, but uh, that tune in completeness gives us friendliness for formal verification and uh, complexity up known up front. Another thing, another limitation is that you cannot invoke one contract from another. That's usually the problem for DSLs. Uh, but as I already said, you can just like you read this paper and you'll understand how to 
use multiple transactions instead of one transaction. Uh, and you can use contract storages or contract states as a message transport. So you can uh, send one message from one contract to another using their storages. If one another has access to storage of another, one contract has access to storage of another contract. Uh, and I want to finish with one uh, small example. Uh, I, know, I know one guy, um, he's a community director in one blockchain project. He's not a developer, he's just like community director. And he was going from uh, St. Petersburg to Moscow. Usually it takes about four hours. Uh, and on the way from St. Petersburg to Moscow, he wrote his own stable coin using DSL. Can you imagine that it would be possible using Solidity or assembly code? I don't think so. So DSLs are really simple for people with, uh, like, we, we, I cannot say that it is possible to write a stable code without any experience in development, but with a very few experience in development, you can do a product. You can do DeFi products. Not only DeFi, but products uh, on, block, on a blockchain. And the side effect of the DSLs is like it re reduces the time to market. I think it is very important in a blockchain. We, we say that, oh, DeFi, there are a lot of users, but to be honest, there are not too many users, so just like a couple of thousands of them, and we are still in experimental stage of DeFi. So it is very important also to make it uh, really fast to go to market. So, um, to be honest, I'm almost done. The only, the only thing I'd like to cover is that when you, usually I talk about DSL, people say, oh, maybe DSL is a good idea, but for example, what are we gonna do if there is no function we need in, a D, in, in that DSL? DSLs are extensible. DSLs are very, powerful tool, but they're extensible. We can just add in the next iteration of this DSL, we can add needed functions. And uh, I just want to ask you, what's the most known DSL right now? The most popular, I, I guess every developer used that DSL. The most popular DSL right now is an SQL. SQL is a DSL. Do you think about SQL, it's uh, maybe it is not so powerful, so I'm not going to use it. I, I really want to write a code, a code on Java, which will extract from the database all the rows, filter it, sort it, sort in it, or doing some stuff on all these rows. No, you use SQL because it is powerful enough. It really works good, it is the, only meaningful way to interact with database right now, I guess. So DSLs are very, very powerful and we can make uh, very good DSL, I guess in the future, in a couple of years, we can see a very good DSL for DeFi products, which will guarantee security, which will be simple, which will help us to uh, experiment with DeFi. So here I'm done, thank you very much. So if you have any questions, I still have five or some kind of that minutes, so I'm ready. Yeah. Now, how long has your team been working on this, and how's the, how, how's the interest so far from the community? Uh, what, in which, about which language you are talking right. about, right? Uh, we have about uh, 20 D apps right now, for example, on Waves. Uh, even more, but in production there are 20, 20 D apps. Um, all of them are written using uh, Write, so DSL, not Turing complete language. Um, so it is pretty interesting, uh, and we even have some uh, teams that are moving from Ethereum to Write because it is much simpler to make a product on top of it. Cool. How long have you been working on it for? Uh, I guess two years. And we have some, a couple of iterations right now. It's version number four as far as I remember, so yeah. Are there any questions more? No, great, thank you, thank you very much.